You are listening to History Man, a project of ekbarns.com, where we walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. On this episode, we're here again with Aaron Kepley from the Rowan Museum, Incorporated in Salisbury, North Carolina. We're going to talk about the Great Wagon Road and its connection to the Patriot cause, the founding of our nation, and the American Revolution, especially in regards to the Southern Campaign. Welcome again, Aaron. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Aaron, we walked through this museum, and it's just a cornucopia of different events, different eras. You see everything from um, the time of the Indians to the time of the Spanish conquistadors, and we move on up to the Revolutionary War. Salisbury is really just a, a wealth of information for a historian, and y'all have presented it well, and I thank you for sitting down with us. So what made Salisbury, in my terms, a gateway to the West uh, during the Revolutionary War? Well, largely because Salisbury was founded on a crossroads. Okay. Or maybe a cross trails would be a better answer. All right. Two great Indian trading paths. Well, actually, let's put it to three great Indian trading paths connected right around where Salisbury is um, in, in its modern placement. Uh, our current square is the intersection of two of those main paths. And that was the great wagon road from Philadelphia to Augusta or uh, I think Savannah or you know, wh- whichever terminus you want to have, make it have it, it's got so many uh, once it gets south of Salisbury it kind of goes different ways the other road is the trading path from Sheraw to the Cherokee and those paths are ancient they go back thousands of years Native Americans used them and when it came time to settle a place in uh, the back country of North Carolina cr- to create a capital, or not a capital, but a c- county seat, they picked this crossroads and built a courthouse right in the center of it. Wow, it was almost like a modern-day interstate of their time. Exactly. In many respects, they took a, uh, a foot trail where the Indians used and made it to where it can take wagons back and forth and uh, connected all of these back country settlements from Pennsylvania all the way down to Georgia. And it's pretty interesting uh, how that worked out. That's exactly how it happened. They, you know, they start the the Iroquois had been using these for a long time, and the local Native Americans have been using them. Uh, and you know, they just took those footpaths, started widening them out, and now we have things like Interstate seventy seven, Interstate eighty five, that roughly follow the same paths through North Carolina and some of South Carolina. And uh, you know, they uh, are based off of those ancient Native American Native American trails. How did it play into the Revolutionary War. Well, Salisbury was pretty much the the last frontier town in North Carolina, you know, going west. And from here, there were lots of attacks staged by the Rowan militia against the Cherokee to push them further across the mountains. Um, And we became a military surplus center, basically. Supplies were kept here. General Green was not happy with the way that we kept muskets here because whenever he needed the muskets that we had here, they were all rusted, but he had a whole bunch of muskets here that he couldn't use. Um, there, there was a shoe factory here um, that made shoes for the soldiers. We kept prisoners here in a prison. Um, and also wagons. The wagon making was very important in Salisbury. Uh, and when uh, that, that, will, that will become even more important when Green comes through. Um, but one of the most important things that Rowan County did was the wheat production that we had, making sure that the Army was fed. Uh, because Rowan County didn't actually have a British Army come through it until s- February of 1781, we were relatively untouched for most of the war. And we were able to really produce and make sure that you know the supplies could get where they needed to go. There were also a lot of connections with people in Salisbury to Pennsylvania because this mostly they came down the wagon road to settle in Pennsylvania. We had a very good network of trade up and down through there. And because of the way the wagon road was, there wasn't much need to trade with the eastern cities in North Carolina, Wilmington, New Bern, places like Bath, places like that. They were kind of on their own, um, and they did their own trade, and we did our trade back here with Philadelphia and Charleston. I would think if uh, generationally, if you're growing up in the backcountry of the Carolinas and you had that particular trade route, you would find it uh, 
somewhat bemusing that you would have to answer to a government all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, and, definitely. Or, or to rely on. So when, when they had a trade embargo, that really didn't affect people here. Not, no, not, not much at all because you know, they were being as far away as they were, they were largely self-reliant. So the artisans that would uh, would be in Salisbury, what what kind of artisans would you have? You mentioned the wagon makers and the shoe industry here. What kind of other artisans did you have? From what I can tell, Salisbury had basically every artisan that any other colonial, coastal colonial town would have by, right? by the time of the Revolution. We were the biggest town in in the frontier at that time. When, as a matter of fact, when George Washington came through uh, Charlotte in 1791, he called it a trifling place. And Salisbury, I forget the exact quote, but he, he called it a, a very well laid out town or something like that, you know. And but yeah, we, we had a very thriving industry here of potters, um, silversmiths, just almost anything that you could think of. But cabinet making, we have some very famous cabinet makers that came out of Salisbury as well. When the British actually did set foot into Savannah and then later took over Charleston and started making their way through South Carolina at a breakneck speed, what happened in Salisbury? Well, that is really when Salisbury became the supply hub of the Continental Army. And if you look at a map of Salisbury, the way the roads... See, Salisbury, we, we call it north, south, east, and west, but Salisbury's actually kind of cocked to the side a little bit. We, we look more like a diamond than a square on a map. I got you. I got you. Yeah. And, and so the way the roads run, we have roads that run to uh, towards Charlotte, but then we also have roads that run down towards, like, Chiral, Camden, and places like that. So... If you are a the, in the Continental Army and you're in trying to do campaigns along the border of North and South Carolina, Salisbury is your natural hub to where you know, that's your fallback point, and that's where you have all of your supplies because you can easily get it wherever it needs to go. Uh, when Tarleton and Cornwallis moved into Camden and started pushing north, we know based on records and history and, and that there was a, a huge exodus, a refugee problem where – the Catawba Indian Nation just left everything and, and, and went to friendly tribes uh, in Virginia, possibly, uh, having to traverse enemy tribes as they went to their friends. But we also know that Andrew Jackson's family, for instance, who was living in the Waxhaws around Lancaster, South Carolina, uh, his mom took them to family that lived here in Salisbury. What happened with the refugees when they came here? Well, Salisbury was definitely a safe haven. I, I guess see. you could say, because we, we, were, we were just far enough away from everything where they were, you, know, you were going to be okay. Um, the, the way the British strategy was, they wanted to control the towns in South Carolina, raise up the loyalists, and then move their way into North Carolina. So they had time, basically. They came to Salisbury. There were probably family connections like Andrew Jackson. Um, if not family connections, there were probably business connections and things like that. Um, and, you know, that Salisbury could also be a very good point from which to go either towards uh, Salem, where the Moravians are, or towards Greensboro, Petersburg, to get away that way. You know, and I mean, that's why the armies would also choose to come through here the way that they did. Because, I see. I see. You know, like, like you say, they're, they're the interstates. How do people flee from a hurricane? You right. know, you, you don't you necessarily use the back roads and snake around and stuff like that. You get on the biggest road you can and try to get as far away as you can as possible to where there's safety. And that interesting? I think Salisbury, even in a hurricane, is a safe place for people from the coast. So how did the, uh, the Great Wagon Road, how did that change in regards to uh, the fledgling nation? How did, how, did, how did that tie into the nation building at that point? Well, the Great Wagon Road, I get the building of the Great Wagon Road really leads to the building of what we think of as the United States. That allowed the backcountry of North and South Carolina and probably even Georgia to be settled. And, you know, Virginia, West Virginia, that area, um, you had these settlers who are able to move, who are, Pennsylvania is where a lot of them are coming in and it's getting overcrowded. And these people who are undesirable to live in the English cities, you know, the, the Scots-Irish, the Germans, the Quakers, uh, Baptists, people who aren't necessarily accepted into English society, they're the ones living on the frontier. And as the frontier gets more and more crowded, they need somewhere to go. The first place they go is south. And then once they go south, after the revolution and the proclamation line is abolished, 
they go west. And one of the places that they leave from is Salisbury. Daniel Boone makes his way down from Pennsylvania with his family, settles north of Salisbury, right off the wagon road. Um, whenever, uh, in 1775, he cuts you know the Wilderness Trail into Kentucky, goes across the Cumberland Gap, and creates a new great wagon road. Basically, one leg of it leaves out of Salisbury, another leg leaves out of Virginia. And that's the way people go to go west. One interesting thing, I, I've recently talked to a descendant of uh, one of my uh, historic houses, patriarchs here, and he lives on the coast at Oregon. He has a modern beach house right there overlooking the Pacific Ocean. He says he has Rowan County antiques from the 1700s in his modern beach house in Oregon. And his family slowly made their way across the country from the 1700s to him living overlooking the Pacific Ocean today. Isn't that fantastic? What yeah. A fan, what a great story. Yeah. And well, tell us a little bit about some of the other histories of uh, of Salisbury and as we move out of the Revolutionary War. Give me some highlights of what uh, if someone were to come come here to the museum, what would they see? Well, after the Revolutionary War, Salisbury was still very reliant on the wagon road for any type of trade, and Interestingly, the uh, railroad, whenever it comes in in the 1850s, it follows a leg of the Great Wagon Road, um, not the one that goes all the way to Pennsylvania, but the side that goes to Petersburg. Uh, uh, from Raleigh to Salisbury, that's the railroad. And the railroad brings us, you know, it's, it's going to bring us all kind of prosperity and all that kind of stuff. It is actually the reason why we had the Salisbury Confederate prison during the Civil War. Okay. And so, you know, the so the prisoners get on the trains in Virginia. They come down. They take this leg of the old uh, Native American trading path on the on the railroad. Now, they get off in Salisbury. the The prison is right beside the railroad, and you know that's where they're put. Salisbury, uh, I guess, is that's not a famous, maybe we're infamous for that prison, um, and the about 5,000, between three and 5,000 men that died there. We have, the, we have some of the largest uh, unknown U.S. soldier graves in the country wow. uh, because, because of that prison. Um, and, you know, that leads us into the uh, early 20th century when a town called Spencer is developed because Salisbury is roughly halfway between Atlanta and Washington, D.C., and Southern Railway needed a stop in between to service their trains. And so they created a town just north of Salisbury called Spencer. I think it's two miles north of Salisbury. And that was where they stopped and complete. they could completely tear a locomotive apart there and rebuild it and put it back on the tracks and keep it going. And so, you know, the, the train industry became just entirely important to Salisbury because of that. Um... And it's following the Great Wagon Road, basically. You know, portions of the Great sure. Wagon Road. And you then, you know, you get into the 20th century again with uh, textiles, with cotton mills and things like that. I mean, they, they largely grow up along the cities that were once a part of the Great Wagon Road or the Great Trading Pass. Right. And, you know, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, uh, Salisbury, Charlotte, Concord, all these places in North Carolina that are associated with textiles. Yeah, there you go. And, of course, you get a little further north in cigarettes. That's right. They, that's all grown, all those things. So, you know, the, not going to say that the, the Great Wagon Road is responsible for all those things, but, you know, this, this trading path that has been in use for thousands of years, first by Native Americans just, you know, walking, then people riding horses and exploring the Spanish used portions of these roads, and then you have wagons, and then you have trains, and... I, you know, I've, I flew from Charlotte to Germany, and on the way back into Charlotte, we fly. We flew over Salisbury. I look down, I see the Yadkin River, I see where we're crossing, and we're, we're coming down the Great Wagon Road. And, but I'm in a plane, you know, 36,000 feet in the air coming into Charlotte. So the, these ancient Native American trading paths, I don't know how they, I don't know how they laid them out and how they did it so perfectly. But they are absolutely 100, you know, just more than useful today. I what mean, a historical nuance. Right, yeah. And uh, it, it's cool when you start digging into that. So thank you so much for sharing that, Aaron. Tell our listeners a little bit about uh, 
some of the things that you have coming up in the museum? Well, one thing that I have coming up on June 12th is the uh, an anniversary of the 240th Race to the Dan. COVID-19 kind of made it to where we couldn't celebrate the actual anniversary, which is, uh, I believe, February, early February of 1781 is when... Uh, Grain and Cornwallis actually came through Salisbury in their famous chase after cowpens that that ended at Guilford Courthouse. Um, so we decided we would try to have something in June, and looks like we're actually going to be able to open it up and do what we want to do. And there will be uh, all of the reenactor units that were at Camden. I've been told are going to be at my event at the Old Stone House in Granite Quarry on June twelfth. And we're going to do different battle scenarios that would have been things that happened during the Southern Campaign on this uh, chase, artillery firing demonstrations. Um, it's just going to be a great day, and I invite anybody to come on out. How would they reach you? How, if they were interested in that, how would they reach you? Well, you can go to rowanmuseum.org and click on events or – Spell that. Oh, R-O-W-A-N-M-U-S-E-U-M.org, and then click on events or – like us on Facebook, um, and I think it's at Roam Museum. And, yeah, if you want to come out, we would love to have you, and we'd love to see you that day. I, I know it's going to be a great event. And you, you compared it to the one in Camden. I know Camden grows and grows every year as uh, interest leading up to our uh, 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War is coming up soon. This is a great prelude to that, and I'm sure our listeners would love to, to see that happen or participate in that. So thank you so much. Appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you for having me again. I, I definitely appreciate it. All right.